Decision. Welcome to the D-List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. It's also the show that made the Kessel List in less than 12 entries. I'm assuming by this point you've all already seen The Force Awakens, or you aren't planning on seeing it, and either way you don't need my recommendation, so I thought instead of a normal review, I'd just list some details I thought were particularly fascinating about the film. Some of these were details that I really loved, others were choices I thought were odd, and still others were just random amusements. All of them led to much joyous discussion with friends and family. So without further ado, here are the observations I found most interesting from my viewings of The Force Awakens. Massive spoilers ahead, but you've either seen the film already or you're not going to. You don't care. Number 11. The Anti-Prequel Checklist. Seems this movie made a point of listing things the prequels did and then doing the exact opposite. The prequels had too many CGI characters? Here's a healthy mix of CGI and puppets. The characters in the prequels were too stoic? Here, characters react emotionally to everything. The prequels over relied on politics? Here, we'll under-explain the political landscape. And we'll even destroy a political planet that looks like Coruscant but isn't. Please like us, we swear we're not a menacing phantom! The first line of dialogue in the movie is Max von Sydow saying this will begin to make things right, so... It's pretty clear that one of the intended central themes of the film is making up for the sins of the past in more ways than one. The thing is, a movie is more than just a checklist of good decisions and bad decisions. And while I definitely like some of these choices, they're not the measure of the film as a whole. In trying so hard to avoid the mistakes of another movie, they easily could have walked right into their own new mistakes. And I'm not saying it's bad to try and avoid the pitfalls of the prequels, I'm just saying it's risky to define your work based on what it's not rather than what it is. Of course, as much as they were trying to distance themselves from the Star Wars that fans hate, they were really trying to align themselves with the Star Wars that fans love. Which brings us to... Number 10. The Nostalgic Fan Service. This isn't even remotely a surprise with big franchise films, but man were there parts that leaned really heavily on nostalgia. I mean, sure, old characters showing up is great, but then there's the big reveal of the Falcon, complete with a joke about how worthless it is, and then there's mentions of the Kessel Run, and Finn accidentally activates the holographic chess game, and there's way so many callbacks to the Death Star, and please love us like you loved Star Wars! Sure, this is nothing new, the prequels were also filled with pointless cameos, and even before familiar characters show up, familiar looking characters show up. One of the first characters is Random Protocol Droid, who isn't C-3PO, but reminds you that Star Wars exists. But now that we're finally seeing the world after the original trilogy, they can really reference the things that we already saw happen. And even the things that aren't references to earlier Star Wars films are references to the types of things that earlier Star Wars films would reference. Finn's Stormtrooper name is FN2187, a reference to an experimental film that was a huge influence on George Lucas and that Lucas himself referenced in A New Hope. We gotta find out which cell this princess of yours is in. Here it is, 2187. Well, it was more subtle than calling him FN1138, I guess. And at least the fan service was never at a terribly inappropriate time. I mean, when Kylo Ren said, I've been waiting for this day for a long time, Han didn't mutter, Yes, I bet you have. And of course, there were several narrative beats that reflected A New Hope very closely, to the point where some people are calling it a remake. I wouldn't go that far, because even when the actual plot events were the same, the emotional and character stakes were completely different. I mean, Rey's arc is basically the exact opposite of Luke's arc, where he wants to do whatever it takes to get off his desert planet, but she's convinced she needs to stay on her desert planet. Still, it was clearly a deliberate effort to evoke a new hope and wash out the taste of the prequels. But on the other hand... Number 9. The Sequel Bait. In direct contrast to the reliance on the past, this film also did a lot of setting up for the future. In fact, it sometimes seems like everyone who's not complaining that the film's a remake is complaining that the film left too many open threads for future movies. Because God forbid that the franchise inspired by old serials be serialized. Probably the most blatant is when Han asked Maz how she got Luke's lightsaber from Cloud City, and she literally says a good question for another time. She might as well just come out and say, you'll find out in the spin-off movie! Or the spin-off video game, or comic book, or novel, or TV episode, or added scene to Star Tours. Star Tours? What are you doing here? I have no idea! But by and large, why is it a bad thing that this movie leaves some threads open for the rest of the trilogy? 
I mean, nobody complains when a TV pilot doesn't conclusively explore every single aspect of its premise. They know that's what the rest of the series is for. And in this case, Kathleen Kennedy and company have the opportunity to plot out this story arc over the course of three movies. They might as well use all three movies to tell the story. Hell, some of my friends who are complaining about the open ends also complained that Phantom Menace wrapped too many things up, such as killing Darth Maul instead of letting him develop as a villain over the course of the whole trilogy. But I think some people's problem is with this balance of throwback and setup. Like it or not, this film is meant to be a transitional film, a passing of the torch from the old franchise to the new generation. To me, what was so exciting about The Force Awakens was that feeling of this brand new adventure, this brand new story, that would be a bridge between what we know and who we know and everything that comes next. And I think some people feel that being transitional robs this film of the chance to form its own identity. But as for me, even though the new characters and concepts aren't completely fleshed out yet, I really like what we've seen of them so far, and I'm really excited about the chance to dig deeper into them over the course of the trilogy. Number 8. The Phineas and Ferb Connection. Hey, did you know that the Phineas and Ferb Star Wars special is great? Because it is. And I know I'm not the first to point out the similarities between the special and the film, but I can't help it. Both of them feature a stormtrooper facing the morality of what they're doing for the first time while a Darth Vader wannabe tries to prove his own strength. And even though none of the original Star Wars cast reprised their role for the cartoon, a surprising number of Phineas and Ferb actors showed up in Force Awakens. Three is a surprising number, right? Simon Pegg appeared in both, and of course Ferb himself, Thomas Brody Sangster, briefly shows up in the movie as an Imperial officer. And Perry himself, Dee Bradley Baker, did some additional voices in the movie. None of that actually means anything significant, I just find it amusing. And I haven't made quite enough videos where I talk about Phineas and Ferb yet. Number 7. The Stormtrooper Moral Dilemma. One of the main characters of this film is a stormtrooper who comes face to face with the horror of his side's actions, faces a moral dilemma, and chooses to leave the stormtrooper life behind. I'm sure this has been explored in the expanded universe somewhere, but it hasn't been explored in the films before. At least not in the non Phineas and Ferb ones. But here, in a real canon Star Wars movie, we discover that even a stormtrooper is capable of choosing to leave a life of evil behind and trying to live a good life and do the right thing. And it's fascinating, but it's Kind of a double-edged sword. In the original trilogy, shooting up stormtroopers is fun because they don't seem human. Don't worry, Lumpy. Stormtroopers don't have souls. But now that we know that stormtroopers are actually capable of redemption, it's a little harder to cheer when they're getting shot up for the rest of the film. They're not robots, Rick! It's a figure of speech, Morty! They're bureaucrats! I don't respect them! Come on, Finn. You grew up with those guys. That's cold. Number six. The Weakness of the Dark Side One of the most surprising aspects of the movie for me was how for the first time in a Star Wars movie, the dark side actually seems vulnerable. I mean, yeah, we've seen minions scared of Jedi before, and the dark side has been at a disadvantage, but even at his weakest, Palpatine was always really confident. This is the first Star Wars movie where the bad guys are just as scared of the good guys as the good guys are of the bad guys. They're afraid that the Resistance is going to find Luke Skywalker. They're afraid that the Jedi will return. Again. And Kylo Ren is afraid because he feels some light in himself. He knows he still has some goodness in him. He's actively trying to pursue the dark side, and he's scared of being tempted by the good guys. That's something that's never been explored in the Star Wars movie before. Of course, there are a lot of interesting facets about Kylo Ren that we haven't seen before. Number 5. Ben Solo, Misguided Fanboy. For all the surface level fan service this movie threw at us, it is particularly noteworthy that the villain of the piece is someone who's clinging to pieces of nostalgia while overlooking the big picture. Kylo Ren idolizes Darth Vader. He models himself after Vader. He wears a mask he doesn't need, builds his own lightsaber improperly, and conveniently glosses over the whole killing of the Emperor and redeeming himself part of Vader's arc. And again, parts of the movie have so much fun reveling in nostalgia that it's clearly not saying nostalgia is evil, but it seems to be advocating taking nostalgia for what it is, but still moving on. Ben Solo clings to his idealized version of the past, idolizing a grandfather he never met. 
And at the beginning of the film, Rey is clinging to her idealized version of the past, going back to the same place every night to wait for a family that we're not even sure if she really remembers. But of course, the difference is, Rey is told to leave the past in the past, and she actually starts to move on. Ben doesn't. And then the movie forces us to let go of the past, or at least a big part of it. Number four. The death of Han Solo. Now, like most of you, I figured out Han Solo was going to die in this movie the moment they announced Harrison Ford was in this movie. Not based on any story knowledge, just based on behind-the-scenes logistics. I knew there was no way they'd get Harrison Ford to sign on for an entire new franchise, and I knew Harrison Ford wanted Han to die in the original trilogy, and my suspicions were all but confirmed as the production team kept referring to this as a transitional film, a passing of the torch. The bridge between what we know and who we know, and everything that comes next. And as soon as Han sees Ben on the Starkiller base, I was like, well, this is the scene where Han dies, because it's obviously not the scene where Kylo Ren's redeemed, so... Time to say goodbye to Han Solo. And looking at Han's face, I think even he knows he's going to die. Or at least that there's a strong possibility he will. But he still takes that risk and reaches out to Ben just on the chance that his family can be reunited and be happy again. This isn't Han rushing in to save the day like the dashing hero. This is Han making the ultimate sacrifice, possibly knowing that it won't pay off. And for a moment this big, it's got to have repercussions in the next movies. There's got to be further consequences to this sacrifice. But the immediate consequence is, that is the moment when the torch gets passed. That is the definitive transitional point of the franchise. When Kylo Ren confronts Rey and Finn in the woods, he says, it's just us now. Han Solo can't save you. He might as well be saying, no more relying on nostalgia. Time to see how the new characters and the new stories stack up. Because even though there are still some characters from the original trilogy around, the human characters are in very different roles than they were in the original trilogy. Which brings us to... Number 3. The map to Luke Skywalker. Okay, this was the element of the movie that seemed the most... underdeveloped. First off, I love you, Mark Hamill, but you did not deserve second billing for two brief cameos, one of which you can't even see your face. You deserved the ant credit, you had almost as much screen time as Max von Sydow. But I was really confused by the whole map to Luke Skywalker thing. Like, okay, so Han says that those who knew Luke best said he went off to find the original Jedi Temple, so was the map a map to the original Jedi Temple? And if so, why were they all so absolutely convinced that that's actually where Luke still was at this moment? And if it was just a map to Luke, who made the map? Who left it? Like, did Luke leave pieces of a map for everyone? How did old Max Vaughn get a piece of the map and then R2 find the other pieces? I mean, the movie sets up like the quest for Luke is the central conflict of the story, but then it's kind of abandoned halfway through for more personal things, which personal stakes are fine, but then it's just brought back up again in basically an epilogue. And again, I'm not complaining that the story's serialized and that we're working with longer arcs within this movie, but it still seemed very weirdly paced to just drop the Luke thing and then pick it back up unrelated to the whole third act conflict. And I've heard the theory that R2 wakes up because of Rey's presence, so if that's true, then there is some causal relation, but it still kind of feels like an afterthought. And I don't know, I'm sure somewhere in the next movie or some tie-in, they'll explain exactly what the details behind the map are, but it was still the part that had me scratching my head the most. Number two. The Mary Sue debacle. There has been a huge controversy over the labeling of the new character as a Mary Sue. Now, this label comes with a lot of baggage, which is not helped by the fact that everybody in the conversation seems to be using six separate definitions of Mary Sue. But in the broadest sense of a perfect character who's good at everything and has no discernible flaws, then yes, there is a clear Mary Sue in the movie, and that Mary Sue is Poe Dameron, perfect human, best pilot in the galaxy, can fly anything, snarks in the face of danger, nice to absolutely everybody, even lets Finn keep his jacket. And I for one was not even remotely bothered by that, partly because it was a relatively small supporting role, but also because Poe Dameron is the classic dashing and pure sci-fi serial hero. I love morally ambiguous, emotionally complex anti-heroes as much as the next fan of narrative, but there was something oddly refreshing about seeing an unambiguous good guy on the screen. 
And Oscar Isaac was so freaking charming and had amazing chemistry with literally everybody he stood next to, even when he stood next to a ball. Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars. He was fun to watch, and it was a small enough character that he didn't need much more dimension than he got for this film, and I think there's room to develop him into something more nuanced for the next one. Okay, okay, I'll address the actual controversy. Is Rey a Mary Sue? Well, she was good at a lot of things, and she may be disproportionately strong in the Force, but it's not like she had zero struggles. I mean, she accidentally let the Raptars loose on Han's freighter, that was a pretty big fuck up. Yeah, she stands her own against a severely injured and internally tormented pseudo-Sith, but she still is barely getting away with her life before she lets the Force control her actions. And unlike most Mary Sues, she actually gets a character arc. The whole leaving the past behind thing that I mentioned in the past. So you already left it behind. Were her struggles and flaws largely superficial? Maybe. I'll acknowledge that she gets over most of them quickly, and it is fair to say that she has more skills than flaws, but generally I believed everything Rey did, and the bulk of her skills were foreshadowed, sometimes subtly. And yeah, it would have been nice to establish that she had ever heard of the Jedi mind trick before she uses it, but it also would have been nice to establish that Luke had ever heard of lifting things with the Force before he did that successfully. I will admit that there are legitimate issues someone could have with the way Rey was written and the struggle she was given, but I don't think Mary Sue is an applicable term for those issues, at least not a useful one. And my number one fascinating observation about The Force Awakens is really an observation about myself as I was watching The Force Awakens. I noticed something strange happening to me. I noticed that I cared. In 2005, after I left the screening of Revenge of the Sith, the emotion I felt most strongly was relief. Not relief that the movie was particularly great, but relief that Star Wars was complete. I could move on. I didn't have to think about Star Wars anymore. I didn't have to invest anymore. I didn't have to hope the next one would be good. I could move on with my life and sever my relationship with this frustrating franchise. And I still had a soft spot for Star Wars over the years, and I revisited the original trilogy from time to time, but it was always from a place of emotional distance. But now I've fallen in love with Rey and Finn and Poe and BB-8 and Kylo Ren, and Star Wars means something to me again. And I'll be disappointed again, I'm sure. Out of the thousands of new Star Wars stories that are going to be told over the rest of my life, there will probably be more disappointments than not, but right now I don't care because right now I'm reminded of the joy a galaxy far, far away can bring. I know this movie isn't perfect, but no flaw can outmatch the way this movie made me feel. This movie made me feel ways about Star Wars I haven't felt since I was a kid. It took me by the hand and told me that it's okay to love again. But hey, some people didn't like it, and that's cool. Hopefully they'll like the next one better. I'm going to go see Force Awakens again, so until next time, this is Dave, signing off. There's Ray, Finn and Poe, and BB-8 as well. What a cute and wacky little droid. And hey, it's Kylo Ren and his back and evil mask. Does he scare you? as much as he scares me.